Hello Year 7, Mr Wright here. We've got a lesson today doing some feedback on the big end of term MCQ that we've just done. Just going to remind you as well, if you're doing your lessons in order today and it's not yet 11 o'clock, uh, just remember that we've got the live session coming up at 11 where I'm going to be doing far more feedback and answering questions as well on the MCQ. So I'd really advise as many people as possible to attend that. So let's crack on with the lesson knowledge check about uh, four minutes or so. If it's taking longer than five, then move on because we've got a few different examples we're looking at today. Uh, combination of topics old and new, some of them you may recognize from the MCQ as well just with a couple of extra uh, examples to help you out. So four or so minutes, off you go. Right, let's look at the answers then. So prime factors, we should hopefully be getting used now to breaking it down into factor trees and starting with the two times tables and working your way up until uh, we can see what they break down into. So 42, firstly, you'd break down into two and 21. And then the 21 breaks down into three and seven, which are both prime. So two multiplied by three multiplied by seven. 45 uh, can't be divided by two. So we go instead into the threes. It can divide by three. It's three and 15. The 15 then breaks down into three and five. So we've got three squared multiplied by five. The table here where I've given you a couple of options to choose from when we're doing our rounding. Hopefully the decimal places weren't too much issue and then significant figures, just making sure that you're aware a significant figure doesn't have to be a decimal place. It's the first non-zero digit. Numbers going in the boxes. So the big mistake that was made before with uh, the MCQ was not taking into account all of the columns that come before where the box is, which meant that quite a few of you missed uh, the fact that there was an exchange there. So in the first one, it's not affected. There's no exchange happening in the tens column. So the hundreds column, we just add the two. But the second one, if we have a look, the ones column, we're adding a seven and an eight together. Now that leaves us 15, not five. Those 10 ones were exchanged into a 10. So you may have added that uh, as a little note if you'd written the column out. Either way, we can see we don't just have three tens already at our disposal. We actually already have four, which means we only need to add another three into our box to get the seven. Uh, very similar with the last one. Three and eight, we can see in the tens column, which means 10 of those tens would have become 100. So we actually already have three hundreds. We only need to add the extra one. Uh, the statements over here. Angles around a point do not sum to 180 degrees, they sum to 360 degrees. And the little two is uh, what we'd call is what we call the index. Um, that's written in superscript, meaning it's in small but above the number at the top there. That is the index, not the power. So you may also want to write those uh, A and C out correctly. Angles around a point sum to 360 degrees. And in 10 to the 2, the 2 is called the index. OK, so let's crack on then with having a look at some of uh, the questions that we needed a little bit of work on. So said we would get back to significant figures versus decimal places. What is this number rounded to two significant figures? And to help us uh, to see where we might be coming from, I've uh, clipped a few of my favorite explanations, uh, both for correct answers and for incorrect answers, because I think they're really insightful. So we're going to have a look together and see what we think. So one person said they found the second significant figure and there was a six next to it. So that must mean they think that the five is the second significant figure. It rounds up. So the five rounds up to six. So that's why they chose 0 0.096. Another comment here. Number starts with zeros, and I know a zero can only be significant if it's between numbers, uh, by which they mean between non-zero numbers. So you can exclude the first two zeros and go straight to the non-zero figures. And then it's uh, giving same thing about the fives, okay? So we seem to be in agreement at the moment about it being part D. The first two non-zero numbers are nine and five, and we're rounding, so we're rounding to the nearest thousandth, so again, we're going with D. 
Then we have an opinion that disagrees. The first two digits are the zero and the nine. So the nine rounds, uh, rounds a zero up to one. So we end up with 0 0.1. So what this person is saying is that this is the first significant figure, this is the second significant figure, and the nine tells us to round that up. So think about how this person is disagreeing with the other two. And the last one I'm showing here, nine and five are the first significant figures. So they believe it's 0 0.095. So let's go back through each of these and I'll remind us what a significant figure is. So a significant figure, these first three people were actually correct. The first significant figure is the first non-zero digit. So the first significant figure we know must be the nine. The second significant figure will then be whichever digit comes after it, whether it's a zero or not. In this case, it happens to be a five that comes after it. So the nine and the five are our two significant figures. And the six next to it tells us that we're going to round up. So 0 0.095 rounds up to 0 0.096. So let's just have a look at the uh, two incorrect explanations and we'll see where they've come from. So the first two digits are the zero, uh, are the two zeros. So remember, these are placeholders, but to be significant, the first significant digit must not be a zero. It must be the first thing that isn't a zero. OK, so this is where this person has gone wrong, because actually when it comes to the rounding, they've done it correctly, but they've used the wrong figures. OK, this one was quite interesting as well to see that they identified the correct significant figures, but they've then cut it off. So rather than rounding, by using this figure here, they've done what we call truncating, which you won't see for a while, is when you do cut it off there. But we round, so we know that the next digit down, the next place value column down, must affect this by either rounding it up or down. So just uh, interesting to see a, a couple of different opinions there. So I'm going to show you, remind you how to round two significant figures with a few examples. 325, so remember what we said, the first significant figure is the first non-zero digit. So in this case, that's the three. We're rounding to two significant figures, so we also need the next significant figure, which is the next digit along, that's a two. So we know that the two is the place where the rounding is going to begin. The five next to it tells us whether we round up or down. Hopefully you remember by now the convention is if there's a five, we're going to round that two up to a three. So we've got 330. We don't need to get rid of any zeros because we need the place values to be held up up until the up until and including the ones column. So that zero stays as it is. 325 to two significant figures is 330. Next one, a little bit different. We've got a decimal in play now, 3.25. So the first non-zero digit is the first significant figure. That's the three. The second significant figure is the next digit, which is the two. Remember, the decimal point isn't a digit. It's just uh, showing you the place value. And the five tells us, again, we're going to round up. So firstly, we end up with something like this. But what's different here versus the 330 is that we now have placeholders after the decimal point. And provided that we haven't got any more significant figures, which we haven't because we've rounded, that zero is no longer necessary. So we can put a nice neat line through it. And our final answer is 3.3. .3. So 3.25 to two significant figures is 3.3. Final one to show you, just to again, so let's think. The first significant figure is the first non-zero digit. So have a think about what that is. Well done if you said the three again. The second significant figure, next digit along, is the two. The five tells us we're rounding up, so it first becomes 0 0.330. Again, that zero, because it's after the decimal place, uh, after the decimal point, sorry, is not necessary. So our final answer, 0 0.325 to two significant figures is 0 0.33. So I'm about to move on to some you do's. Pause and rewind if you need a hand at any stage. If not, here we go. We've got <coughs> a few for you to have a go at, a couple of chilly ones as well for those who get through it quickly. 
I'd recommend two minutes or so getting through this. Okay, let's have a look then. Answers coming up in three, two, one. So I'm just going to hopefully A and B <clears throat> should have been fairly straightforward. C is where we first have a zero uh, being encountered. So the first significant figure was the two and the four tells us to round down. For D, even though there is a zero, it doesn't matter because it's after the first significant figure. So the first sig fig is the two, the zero tells us that we're rounding down. So that's our answer. Again, we don't need the decimal point and any zeros after it because it's just an integer. 0 0.0057, so the first significant figure is the five and we round it up because of the seven, so it's 0 0.006. Uh, for the chili ones, F, you had to do the addition first and then round it. And G, you need to convert first, so 0 0.8 add 0 0.13. So that's 0 0.93 and that rounds to 0 0.9. Really well done if you got those correct. Uh, if you have any questions, pop them in the comments or ask me on the live stream at 11 o'clock. <clears throat> have a look at another question that quite a few people made some mistakes on. So I want to see uh, the kind of comments we were coming up with here. So let's have a look at this triangle first. We can see it's an isosceles triangle and also it tells us. And we can see these two little lines here. Uh, those two lines are telling us where the equal angles are. So we know they're going to line up. So we should know, hopefully, that this angle is also going to be 74 degrees. At this point, let's have a look at some comments here. Also, I'd like to point out here at the top the not to scale, because there are some interesting comments that I'm going to mention in a minute, but it means you cannot trust the diagram with your eyes. You can only trust the numbers that they give you. So let's have a look. The sides which have the two little lines means the lines are equal to each other, which is uh, very good reasoning. Yep, they have equal lengths. So we know that this angle must also be 74 over here. So again, this, per this next person's elaborated, two sides are equivalent. So 74 add 74 to give us 148. And we know that the sum of the three angles is 180. So they've done the subtraction to give an answer of 32. So just to show you <clears throat> the full workings of how we do this, remember uh, the way I've recommended to you in the past is using a bar model. So we have our bar of 180 degrees, that's the total for the triangle. We know that we have two equal angles of 74 and we have our mystery angle left over. Then we can simplify that by adding the 74s together to get that 148, same as that person in the second comment has mentioned. So we can see we need the difference from 180 to 148 being 32 degrees. Just going to at this point again, mention the fact that because this says not to scale, you cannot get away with things that I saw some people saying like, well, this is clearly smaller. You don't know it's smaller until you found out the answer. OK, so it's really important that you don't assume this is smaller just because it looks smaller on the diagram, because it's deliberately saying this diagram visually is not drawn accurately. So this could actually be bigger and just be drawn slightly inaccurately. OK, um, equally. Some several people putting 106. Remember, all three angles need to add together to make 180. So if these two added to 180, this angle couldn't exist and therefore it wouldn't be a proper triangle. OK, so just be really uh, careful with that. But the bar model is the best way to go here. So a few examples here. Uh, a chili, which is a little bit harder. You've got to do multiple things to work that out if you get through the rest of these. So you've got to determine where the equal angles are, then draw the bar model corresponding to that and work out your missing angle for each case. One or two of them may not need a bar model. That's entirely up to you. But uh, go through, work out where all your angles are. If you need to copy the diagram and annotate it, that's also fine. That's, uh, that's actually a really good idea. So if you're stuck, draw the diagram out yourself and try adding your own labels and seeing if you can help yourself there. 
I'd recommend about a minute per question here, maybe closer to 90 seconds for the chili once you get to it. Um, so you're talking about five, six minutes here. Uh, and then we will go through some stuff. Also, what I'll do, just to give people a bit of a head start with this first one, we know that we're summing to 180 degrees. Have a think about where that angle P resides and whether it's going to be equal or not to the 35 degrees. So what you should hopefully notice is that you've got two equally sized angles of 35 degrees and then our missing angle P, okay? I'm gonna leave that there because you can simplify the bar model by yourself and say five or so minutes, off you go. Right, let's have a look through then. So this first one, resolving it, the 235s add to 70 degrees, take that away from 180 and we should have an answer of 110 degrees. This second one, the triangle spun around a bit and the lines are in different places, so need to make sure we know what's going on here. So hopefully we started with our model of 180. And then if you noticed, the angles are actually in identical positions to where they were when the triangle was differently oriented. So we still have two equal angles of 35 degrees, which still add to 70. P is still 110 degrees. Now, the third one is where you can capitalize on where I said you don't necessarily need a bar model for all of these, because if you notice, 35 degrees and P are the two equal angles. So we immediately already know that P must be 35 degrees. Fourth one then here with this inverted triangle upside down, we can see this time the 35 is not one of the equal angles. So we're going to use a slightly different model here. So we start with 180 at the top. Underneath, we have two angle P's or two question marks, however you laid it out, and then are 35 degrees. What I would then do at this point is to work out uh, the combined total of those two equal angles, which hopefully you would have seen as 145 degrees. At this point, you might want to draw your own separate model just so you're not getting too overwhelmed by it. So you'll get something that looks like this. We know we need to divide it exactly into two. So half of 145, which is 72.5 degrees. Really well done. If you got that, just gonna talk you through this top one, just because we're running out of space a little bit. The 140 degrees we notice is on a straight line. Because it's on a straight line, what do we know about angles on a straight line? We know they sum to 180 degrees. So this missing angle here is 40 degrees. We can see this as an isosceles triangle. So if this is 40 degrees, this must also be 40 degrees. So let's keep count. In total, we have 80 degrees in this triangle so far. We need 180 degrees. So P must be 100 degrees. Really well done if you managed to do that. Please let me know in chat or in private comments if you had a go at that, because I'd really like to see how you got it. Okay, one last section we're going to have a look through today on one of the big misconceptions in the uh, MCQ. So it was finding a length in the parallelogram when we knew the area. So the main sticking point here was people mixing up the uh, two dimensions. I think most of us, few exceptions, but most of us remembered that we're to get from the area to one of the lengths, we need to divide the area by one of the lengths that we already know. The thing that a lot of people mixed up was which length we, uh, we actually need and which is appropriate to find our missing length at the top there. So remember, with any quadrilateral, particularly parallelograms, it's super important. The two dimensions that we're using to find the area must be perpendicular. They must be at a right angle. So this square is the key to everything. Where does it line up with? Does it line up uh, our length with our three centimeters or does it line it up with our four centimeters? And you can see it clearly lines us up with the three centimeters. So a lot of people using the bus stop method, which is good to see. Then we're dividing that 483 by three. And we can see at the bottom there, someone left all stages of the working of their divisions. So they've said area equals 
base multiplied by height or height multiplied by base. 483 equals three multiplied by something. So they've used the question mark there. And the question mark must be equal to 483 divided by three. That's really nicely laid out. I was really liking some of the comments here for the correct answers. Even some of the incorrect answers were using a fantastic method. They just used the wrong number. So it's really important that we use the correct numbers that we go for the perpendiculars. So in this case, it's 483 divided by three to give us our correct answer of 161. So at that point, what I want us to test now to see if we've got it correct is whether we can identify which sides we need in order to find uh, lengths and to find areas. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here, which two lines are multiplied together to find the area. I've got a couple of different diagrams and we're going to solve those in a second. Key note to write down, particularly if you got that question wrong when you did the MCQ, hopefully you know whether or not you did. Even if you're not entirely sure of this rule, I'd really recommend writing it down. So in any quadrilateral, that's even the ones with the more difficult rules. You don't need that bit in brackets, but that's just to emphasize. So even ones that we haven't come on to yet that have got slightly trickier area rules, doesn't matter. Any quadrilateral, the dimensions used to find the area, the base and the height must be perpendicular. OK, so it's really important that we have perpendicular heights. We're looking for that right angle. And that little square is always going to show us if a right angle is there, and then we will know to use it, even if the diagram's not to scale. So this first uh, diagram here on the left, we look for our right angle here and we can see it connects lines B and C. So they're the two dimensions that we can use to find the area. Now, occasionally they'll try and trick you by using the line that you wouldn't expect because this line down here, it, this length is always nice. Uh, it's normally nice and straight, it's level. Everyone assumes that's always going to be where uh, one of our dimensions we use to find the area. But remember, we're not looking for how straight this line looks because the diagram's not to scale. We're looking for that right angle, that little square. And where does it appear? It appears here, which connects A and C. And so those are the two in this case that would multiply to find the area. So we look for that right angle. Once we see it, the two lines that it connects must be the two that we use to find the area of these parallelograms. So with that in mind, hopefully you've paused and taken notes at this point. With that in mind, let's have a go at finding some ourselves. Again, I would say about three to five minutes on this, uh, depending on if you're drawing things out and things like that. Um, let me know which two lines by using the letters are multiplied to find each of these areas. Off you go. So let's break these down then. So the first one hopefully looked familiar because we saw a version of it in the I do. So B and C are the ones we need here. This second one, we look for the square again. We can see A and C are connected. Hopefully you've seen at this point, once you remember the rule, it's actually quite easy. The diagram makes it, uh, makes it fairly straightforward for us to work out which lines are connected. We can see here the squares connecting B and C. We can see here it's connecting A and C. This one is connecting B and C. And this one, there is no square. It might, even in times where it might look like a right angle, if we see no square, we cannot assume a right angle. So this one is actually impossible. There is no way using a combination of these three lines that you could calculate the area. Um, eventually later on at A level, then yes, there might be ways we could find the area of this parallelogram, but using the methods that we want at this point, we cannot find that area. Okay, so well done if you said that that couldn't be done. So I'm aware at this point, because we've been through a fair few explanations and we've made quite a few notes and done a bit of practice, that you may be short on time. So if you're finding that you're within the last 10 minutes of the lesson, don't worry about doing the 10 quick questions, just go straight on to the quiz. And the password for today is 75. So just make sure you've got that ready to go. If, however, you've got uh, a little bit longer than that, if you've still got 15 or so minutes, then you can have a go at 
the 10 quick questions, which are just some facts on uh, factors and multiples. So just recapping what we've been doing in some recent lessons. So you're gonna have two minutes in three, two, one, off you go. Sorry about that, just realized there's a little bit of a problem there, so I'm just going to fix that. All right, got it fixed now. So three, two, one, off you go. Ten seconds. Three, two, one. Pens down, swap over. And let's go through these nice and quickly. So the factors are coming up. Oh, they've appeared in a different order. There we go. Factors on the uh, there now. The multiples, when we're asking for a multiple of something, it just means multiplying three by 10. So it's the third number in the 10 times table, which is 30 and so on and so forth. Product and sum deliberately put those there to try and test you again, because I saw a couple of people who said they couldn't remember the difference between product and sum. Product is multiplication, sum is addition and difference is subtraction. March has 31 days, April has 30 days, if you weren't sure there. Facts of 65 I've laid out there for you. We've added them together to make 84. So really well done. If you got those correct, let me know. And uh, hopefully I will see as many of you as possible at 11 o'clock for the live stream. Thank you very much.